Now let's kick this thing off. Adam Healy is the chief security officer at BlockFi. In this conversation, we talk about the things that BlockFi is doing to secure crypto assets on their platform. Also, how they deal with security issues at their vendors. And then he gives a bunch of advice for you at home on how you can protect your own crypto assets and also how to think about things like physical security. I really enjoyed this conversation with Adam, and I hope you do as well. Before we get into this episode, though, I want to quickly talk about our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Exodus, the world's leading desktop, mobile, and hardware crypto wallet. They offer beautiful, user-friendly blockchain products that sync across all of your devices, making it easier to send, receive, and exchange over 150 or more crypto assets in one place. And with world-class customer service available to you 24-7, Exodus always has your back. But the fun doesn't stop with staking and trading. They recently launched a new NFT marketplace where you can buy and sell your favorite NFTs on the Solana network. By partnering with the popular NFT platform Magic Eden, they're offering the full Monty on verified collections with more added every single day. Ready to check it out for yourself? Run, don't walk, over to exodus.com slash pomp for your free download today. Again, if you want the world's leading desktop, mobile, and hardware crypto wallet, go to exodus.com slash pomp today. Today's episode is sponsored by Abra. They're based in California and they're backed by top VC firms. Abra is an all-in-one, simple, secure app that allows you to trade over 110 cryptocurrencies, get 0% interest loans using your crypto as collateral, and earn interest with up to 13% APY on stablecoins and 7.15% APY on Bitcoin. You can join nearly 2 million users by downloading Abra from the Google Play or Apple App Store. If you download the app today, you will get $15 in free crypto once you fund your account. You came, you invested, now conquer. Abra, conquer crypto. Go check it out today. This episode is brought to you by DeFi Technologies. DeFi Technologies represents what's next in the digital economy. They're providing simplified, trusted access to crypto, decentralized finance, and Web3 investment opportunities. Institutions and investors can gain diversified, secure, compliant, and easily tradable access to a diversified set of industry-leading equity products and protocols through a single stock purchase on a regulated exchange. DeFi Technologies is currently listed on the U.S. exchange at DEFTF stock ticker and the Canadian NEO exchange at DEFI. For more information or to subscribe to receive company updates and financial information, visit their website at DeFi.tech. I'm really excited about what these guys are doing. I've become an advisor to the business, and I highly suggest you go check them out. Go to their website at defi.tech today. All right, let's get in this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Anthony Pompliano runs Pomp Investments. All views of him and the guests on his podcast are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Pomp Investments. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Pomp or his guest as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his personal opinion. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have Mr. Adam Healy joining us now. Adam, how are you? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm super excited to uh, to talk about this. Before we get started, maybe a, a good kind of um, setting the scene, if you will, would be uh, your role at BlockFi and kind of how you guys think about security um, and the importance in the industry. And then we can get into both for various platforms and then also for individuals in, in uh, crypto. Great. So um, my role at BlockFi is pretty broad, a lot more than you'd see at um, another firm for a traditional you know, head of security or CISO type role. Um, I obviously have all of our security program or security infrastructure um, I also see all of our, any, anything that really gets us close to on-chain, so cryptography, blockchain engineering, um, our work with various custodians across the landscape. Um, and then it just so happens that I also manage all of our corporate IT infrastructure, which makes the security job actually a lot easier. You know, in terms of you know, what, what, what kind of we think about at BlockFi um, in terms of security and more broadly across the general um, industry is it's paramount. A core competency for any firm that is um, that has crypto on their platform, whether that be their internal funds or client funds. Um, security has to be paramount. It has to be a core competency. And where we've seen issues in the industry, it's usually where uh, those firms are not taking that uh, to heart and they're not treating it as a core competency that they have to develop and go along that journey. 
Yeah. So yeah. when we think about security in crypto, it's it's a really interesting thing because one, it's a little bit more of a technical industry. Uh, there's money involved, right, which obviously creates a better economic incentive or, or more uh, uh, kind of honeypot, if you will, for, for people to do bad things. Uh, but also um, we're talking about assets that are bearer assets. And so therefore it almost is like, you know, double incentive for, for people to, uh, to look at these as targets. So when you guys think about security, I, as an outsider to uh, to kind of the security vertical, if you will, would just think of it as there's things you can do internally for your uh, both your customers or, or clients, but also for your employees. And then there's things where you rely on outside service providers and they've got to take care of their security as well. Is that a fair way to kind of create a framework for like how a platform thinks about security is kind of like internal and external security. Yeah. I, I think, you know, this is something that um, I, I wish I could own that kind of way of thinking about it, but this is something that AWS coined years ago when, when, when cloud became the way that the general world started to compute uh, AWS said it will handle security of the cloud clients of AWS block being one of them, many others, I'm sure they're listening are as well. Um, we'll need to handle security in the cloud, meaning we're still responsible for everything that we deploy in the cloud and AWS, Amazon will handle security of the cloud. So I look at that very similar. You know, we have to protect not only our employees, our employee data, client data, client funds, internal funds for the company, um, but then also uh, do things to educate and evangelize security, not just with clients, but also with regulators and insurance companies and partners and vendors um, and making sure that anyone we're trusting, whether it's a vendor or a partner, uh, as part of our day-to-day -day business, they're meeting our security bar and we're holding them to that. Yeah. And so when you start to think about internally, what are some of the things that you guys think about? And obviously, uh, it's a little bit of a hard conversation because part of security is not telling people what you do from a security standpoint. Uh, but but like, what are the things that uh, end up being kind of core competencies that every crypto company uh, really thinks about in the security realm? Sure. So and I would push back on that a little bit. I would say people that use obfuscation as part of their security program are generally hiding something. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, I was, um, it's kind of timely. I was on a phone call about two hours ago with a, um, with another company in the crypto space and they didn't want to provide us certain transparency into their security program. Obviously, you know, the, the, I won't go into too much detail for, for various reasons, but to me, that's a red flag. Like you should trust your controls. You should trust your security program and really aim to be as transparent as you can. Obviously that's a tough needle to thread, but I think we do a pretty good job of that. I, I've penned a few blog posts. Uh, we, we regularly are out talking to clients on webinars. I did a Reddit AMA. We like to talk about our security program. So I think that should be a red flag for those that are using obfuscation as part of their security program. The, the other things that we think about is, is really everything. So the, 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 the table stakes is good enterprise cyber hygiene making sure that you're running a secure environment with all of the normal cybersecurity controls and technical controls that you would find at any financial services organization, whether it's an insurance company or a bank or, or even you know, in healthcare, there's a lot of uh, intersection points in terms of how the, the, the sensitivity of the data they store. And then from there, you start to get into nuances of crypto. Things that we care a lot about are things like insider threat. Ultimately, we have to trust employees to run the business. So how do we instrument log data, data, that inter, other enterprise data across the environment to make sure that employees um, are not doing anything that is either unwittingly bad, meaning um, their accounts have potentially been taken over by a third party, or knowingly bad, and it's actually a true insider threat concern. So we spend a lot of time thinking and working on that, um, and in addition to kind of just the core security hygiene. Another piece that I, I think is is part of that core competency of the security uh, envelope that anyone dealing with um, internal or um, client crypto assets needs to be thinking about is key management. Private key management is incredibly difficult. And that's essentially what we're talking about, right? The bearer instrument, the kind of to use your words, the bearer instrument that we're talking about is the private key that allows me to send a Bitcoin from me to you. That, that key is controlling that and making sure that it is um, controlled in a way such that it's not subject to insider threat. It's not subject to external threats. Um, it's incredibly safe, but then also having that balance of we need to be able to move assets to run our business. So building those muscles around private key management, it's incredibly difficult for anyone that has ever worked in security or technology um, that, that might be listening. You know, you just ask yourself, how did my company manage private keys, you know, pro public key infrastructure uh, more broadly across their company. And, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time, almost 20 years. 
And most companies and most even, you know, my, my previous role within the government, most government agencies don't do it very well. So that is a very niche skill. And it's very important to any firm that's operating in crypto. How do you think about that as a, as a specific point of uh, importance uh, crossing over to individuals as well? Most of the people listening to this uh, have crypto. They work in the crypto industry. They, they're responsible for uh, some sort of assets. How do you think about the key management that is so integral to a business like BlockFi or others, but also the same tenets seem to apply to individuals? Yeah, so I think we, we we kind of think about that in a couple of different ways. So there's the enterprise key management, which is what BlockFi does or any custodian is going to be doing. And then there is the, as an individual, I have certain, um, if, I, if maybe they're keys or maybe they're just like secrets, passwords, 2FA secrets, API tokens, et cetera, that I have as a personal crypto investor that I need to safeguard. And, and that kind of is a, is a is you solve that problem differently, right? You solve the enterprise problem differently than you do the individual problem. So for me, um, and what I recommend to anyone that I um, anyone that I'm, I'm you know, talking to about, hey, how do I how do I safeguard my personal crypto or my personal identity more broadly? It comes back to a lot of the, like the tried and true stuff, right? It comes back to um, using strong complex passwords, multi-factor authentication. It's all the stuff that anyone in security has been preaching about for years, and it's doing that in a way that is thoughtful, understanding that it's going to take a little bit more time. Um, and it's going to be a little bit cumbersome at times. I've gone kind of down this rabbit hole personally to where even on my mobile device that I leave the house with, I don't have um, anything on it. I have uh, a mapping app. I have a uh, signal. I have text messaging, nothing else. I don't have email. I don't have calendar. I don't have um, any banking finance apps, anything. Now there's obviously pros and cons to that, but my concern is I don't want that phone falling into the, to the wrong hands from a personal crypto investor perspective and having the ability to move funds, move assets, you know, masquerade as me with um, some emails, whatever that might be. Um, and then kind of boiling that down even a little bit deeper down like the crypto, uh, the, the, the crypto stack, if you will, is for those that are managing their own keys. And how do you, um, and this could be a whole separate conversation. I, I've, I've walked through this with so many people over the years. How do you manage your own you know, cold cards or ledgers and backup seed phrases? And how do you do all of that? That can get pretty complex and it can get pretty te technical, but for anyone that's, um, that feels confident in managing their own keys, I definitely think for a portion of your crypto assets, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Joe, John, what questions do you guys have? Adam, are there any things, you don't have to name people specifically or other companies specifically, but mistakes that people, right. that, that <laughs> mistakes that people are making uh, when it comes to security in the crypto industry today? Yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of touch on a couple of things. Institutions, institutions aren't asking the right questions. We work with hundreds of institutions at BlockFi and we work with a number of different crypto custodians and crypto service providers. And every time we send out our questionnaire, but these are the, the, you know, the 30 questions that we care about from a crypto custodian that gives us a good risk thesis on do we trust them or not? Obviously we do a lot of deeper diligence, but just kind of at the, the table stakes security, we generally get feedback that this is a great questionnaire. No one else asks these questions. Um, so I think from an institutional perspective and an enterprise perspective, companies aren't asking the right questions. And the sad part is it's not their fault. It's, it's the, the skills that it takes to actually ask the right questions and then be able to interpret the answers. Those are pretty niche skills. And there's not a lot of people in the space that um, that, that can do both of that. We've actually debated internally um, about potentially opening open sourcing our due diligence questionnaire that we use for crypto service providers and custodians. Um, it's something that we kind of go back and forth on because we do treat it a little bit like intellectual property, um, but it's something we might do in the future and certainly we're considering as a contribution to the broader ecosystem. For individuals, I think it would really scare folks and it's not just BlockFi and it's not just crypto, but even data that uh, Microsoft has released around the number of people within enterprise O365 tenants that don't have two-factor authentication on. So I think that to me, if, if we, if every, if every individual turned on two-factor authentication for every financial app they have, whether it's BlockFi or any bank or anything, um, you'd see fraud rates be dropping by double digits overnight. Um, so I think that is the easiest button for, in, for individuals. Um, and then I think for, um, for people that are maybe managing their own keys, I, I think they don't think through the threat models, right? I think they, they over-index on the government coming after their crypto, and they don't over-index on the 
um, the, the person down the street or their best friend or their neighbor or their brother-in-law um, acting nefariously. So I, I think people that are managing their own keys, they, they, they get a little too um, over-indexed on, on big threats and they don't think about like the threats that are around the corner. Adam, so last year there was like six times more stolen funds crypto-wise than in 2020. Why do you think all this is happening? Is it just adoption or what do you think is going on here? So, yeah, I think the, the pie is getting bigger. More people are holding crypto. So the, the by definition, almost the amount of people that can be targeted with scams, with phishing, with SIM swaps, with all of that is getting bigger. The pie is getting bigger. The other piece is there's a lot of liquidity out there now, and there's a lot of ways to move crypto around that maybe weren't there three or four or five years ago, or factually weren't there three or four or five years ago. I've been working full time in crypto since end of 17, early 18. And before that, I have, have, have been involved in different ways. But there, there's certainly a broader interest, and that is going to bring the bad guys. Uh, it's like with anything that you see, right? Credit cards were a new thing. Well, it brought the bad guys. And then credit cards switched to chip and pin, and or chip, at least in the US. That brings a different type of threat actor. And we're just going to see that. And it's, it's a little bit of a game of whack-a-mole. It always has been. It's a little bit of a game of cat and mouse. It always has been. Wherever the money is, is where the bad guys are going to go. And that's just, I think, what we're seeing now. And I also think, if we think about it, if we kind of zoom out and go more like macro geopolitical, we're seeing very sophisticated threat actors, um, either you know semi-nation state or um, semi-nation state backed or some loose affiliation targeting crypto because it's a mechanism that they can use to um, to get their hands on liquidity that isn't necessarily bound by the traditional financial services market. But that doesn't mean it always works. Even with some of the big breaches we've seen, it's very difficult to move those funds and to cash them out afterwards. Uh, based on, as we all know, um, it's not uh, anonymous. It's not actually something that lends itself to kind of wa- widespread fraud or widespread um, malfeasance. It is. Th- there are plenty of tools out there, and there are plenty of um, of agencies that are looking at it now. And there's plenty of third parties that are helping them um, provide that transparency. So, you know, I, I think it, it's all of those things, and probably it'd be hard to say kind of which is more and which is less. Gotcha. Adam, when you start to think about uh, kind of adoption cohorts, we had the individuals, then we had organizations, both public companies, financial institutions, et cetera. And now we're starting to get into what I would consider the nation states. Talk to me about what you're seeing there uh, from a security standpoint and how important some of that uh, kind of difference of uh, uh, a a difference of uh, the, the adoption and security that's necessary for a nation state versus an individual. Sure. So I think as the threat, you know, kind of to my earlier point, like as the threat landscape changes and matures, organizations have to get better. The, the reality is, um, you know, a, a rogue nation state is probably not targeting an individual crypto investors unless you're really vocal, you're known to be holding crypto, you know, people know that you have a lot of assets. Um, those folks might have a unique threat profile beyond kind of the, the, the day-to-day crypto investor. Um, I, I was going to say the average, but I really don't think there is an average crypto investor um, these days. So you know, more prominent, just like with anything, the more prominent someone is, the more risk they're going to have. Um, there's a lot of uh, kind of similarities potentially between like physical risk, right? The, the more prominent a celebrity or a movie star or an investor or someone is or a businessman uh, or woman is, the, the more there is a potential risk for them to have some type of physical violence done to them. So they approach security in a different way. And I think same thing for, for institutions. You know, we've seen so many institutions enter the space and um, in the four years or so that, I, that I've been in crypto full time, the change has been from should we, um, when talking to institutions, should we get involved in crypto to now it's, well, the should is a foregone conclusion. We definitely are. The question is just how much. And, and that's really what I've seen. And I think firms, again, are really struggling with what are the right questions to ask? How do we have to adapt our current enterprise security practices for this new asset class? And for this new asset class that has some fairly unique risks that we know, to your point, are being targeted by nation states for theft. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a, of a paradigm shift for, for institutions because you can't just apply boilerplate cybersecurity, boilerplate enterprise security. And I have personally have been on the phone with numerous um, large financial institutions kind of helping talk through some of the, the things that we see. And it's, I think, almost always really eye-opening to them, the different types of risks and the the scope of existing risks that expand when dealing with crypto. 
When you do think about physical security, like how, how do you think about that? So somebody's watching and whether they've got a hundred dollars worth of crypto or they've got, you know, millions of dollars, how, how do you usually, um, kind of advise your friends or family or anything there in terms of what they should think about? Yeah. Um, you know, first you probably don't talk about it. Um, that's hard for some of us, right? We Whoops. work in the space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. So there's a, um, it's one of those things where there's, um, I, I would recommend folks not to talk about it outside of trusted circles. Obviously, you know, we all want to get our friends and family into Bitcoin. We think there's a lot of upside there that, that still remains possibly, obviously not financial advice. Um, but we, we, we want to talk about it among certain groups that, that we have some level of trust with. I just wouldn't be flashing it. I wouldn't be super out there with it. I wouldn't be very vocal about it. It is one of those things where you can store a lot of assets on a ledger device or, you know, however, and that is a bare instrument. So I would be just exercise good operational security, good OPSEC, as we would say in the military. Um, for those of us that are out there, we have to like really think through what our, um, what our approach is, you know, do, do, do we want to be more out there? And, and in, in kind of personal operational security, personal OPSEC, there's this philosophy, right? What do you project and what do you protect? What information do I protect? And then what do I put out there? Um, you know, you could put out there, for example, uh, well, I don't actually control any of my crypto. My, you know, my accountants and my lawyers do, and, and then they make trades based on, you know, me giving them instructions over a Zoom call. Like you could write a blog post about your personal, personal operational security practices such that someone would, and obviously not give all the details, but such that someone would, would probably put you um, more down the, the stack of people that they would want to go to, go after. Um, and there's, you know, people that are maybe more accessible. I use the, the analogy, you know, you don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be faster than you. Um, so that, that, that's, that's one approach to it. And I think it's, it's one of the pieces that is less talked about, but we have certainly seen crimes against people, um, you know, in, in New York City, certainly in Asia, in, in other parts of the world, without a doubt where there have been crimes to up and to include kidnapping, specifically individuals to go after crypto. Yeah, it's uh, it's scary stuff. But I think that to your point, uh, having a good plan, having the the security in place uh, ends up being uh, uh, things that you can do in advance, right? It, it's kind of like an insurance policy. Most people think they don't need it, but uh, this is a message for people to uh, to take it seriously. You know, one, one of the one of the, the individuals on my team, um, she likes to say, if you're always ready, you never have to get ready. That's true. The, uh, what, what did uh, Conor McGregor said a version of that? He said, uh, stay ready so you ain't got to get ready, which is uh, yeah. which is perfect. Um, I, one other thing I want to ask you about, I saw some people in the chat talking about um, the HubSpot incident. Obviously, this affected tons of different companies in crypto because they just naturally use them as a vendor. And so, uh, one, just to be clear, uh, this was an incident at HubSpot, not in any of the crypto organizations, including BlockFi, but talk through a little bit as to how you guys think about vendor security and is there things you can do to mitigate potential issues there? Just kind of, you know, how, how do you guys think about something like this? Sure. So we have a full kind of end-to-end -end vendor management, third-party risk process. The, the, the security team is part of that. We don't manage that, but we're very... Um, very in the weeds on that. We have a lot of due diligence that we do around vendors. We're looking at things like SOC 2s, penetration tests, security policy reviews, um, and a number of other things that, um, that we analyze when determining is a vendor right for BlockFi. The, the reality is, you know, HubSpot's a real company. They're a publicly traded company. They have thousands of employees. They have um, third-party attestations of their security program. But that doesn't really, to me, um, always work, right? Obviously, it didn't work at HubSpot. There's plenty of different breaches that we could see over the years where firms had all of those things. And I, I think this is one of the situations where you can do all of the right things. You can check all the right boxes. You can have a mature security program that addresses real risk. And the, the bad guys will still find a way in. And that's pretty much what we saw at HubSpot. And uh, obviously, probably lesser news in crypto, but just as big, if not um, actually, I would argue considerably bigger news. Well, it was the Okta breach recently as well. But at HubSpot, you know, the, what, what happened was for us, we, in addition to analyzing third parties and doing a lot of diligence around them, we also uh, monitored logs. So we were able to see uh, it, it was Thursday evening. And we actually know the exact time where we saw a HubSpot employee from a HubSpot IP address access our HubSpot instance and export files um, or export data. 
Um, and th that data was specifically CRM data, generally data that you would find for marketing purposes, things like email, name, phone number, et cetera. So we were able to see that essentially in real time and kick off our incident management process and shortly thereafter alert HubSpot. Um, it is my understanding that HubSpot actually didn't identify this issue prior to being notified by a client. I don't know if we you were the client that notified them first, but that my understanding is they, they, their internal security program, their internal telemetry didn't uh, create a red flag for this and alert for this. And it was actually the, a client notifying them that, that caused them to go into incident response mode. Since then, we've worked very closely with them. We've um, thoroughly analyzed all the data. We've, we've taken a number of different steps to secure all of our data in HubSpot. What I would like to see and this is technically you know, somewhat difficult, but a lot of vendors do it, is I would like to see more vendors allowing clients, so firms like BlockFi, to manage our data that is in their environments with customer managed keys, keys that where we control the encryption of the data, such that if there is a compromise on the vendor side, they would not necessarily have access to that data um, without also getting access to our encryption keys. Yeah, that would be super fascinating if they started to do it, but it would break the kind of what, the way they think about their business, data management, et cetera. But I think to your point is they're kind of being forced. I, I, think there's, I think there's a lot of interesting things that have been done in crypto, specifically MPC, mm -hmm. where some very novel solutions could be done around third-party data management that no one is really talking about. Yeah. What, one uh, last question I want to ask you is when you think about security in general, whether it's for the platform, for the individual, et cetera, are there any good resources that you would recommend? Uh, obviously, I'm assuming the, the BlockFi blog would be great in terms of some of the pieces that you've penned and, and others on the team. But are, are there things that folks, if they say, hey, look, I really enjoy this conversation. I want to go learn more. Like, where would you send them? Yeah, it's a good question. There, there's a ton of resources out there. I, I think for everyone, a good kind of one on one starting point, certainly read the BlockFi blog, certainly follow um, the, the kind of infosec or the cybersecurity community on Twitter, there's a ton of different um, voices that are talking about a wide range of issues that span crypto, um, personal security, operational security. I would also just kind of tell everyone, and you know, something that, that we think about a lot is how do we make the user experience better? And, and this is kind of where I would ask for like partnership across um, all of the user bases is how do we make the user, the user experience better? And sometimes we, we have to slow things down in order to better analyze risk and to better analyze the safety of the platform. And sometimes that, um, that can impact clients say fast withdrawals. Everyone wants really fast withdrawals, but for us, it's, we actually need a little bit of a speed bump there such that we can um, run our risk analytics, our fraud analytics, our security analytics in the event that there is some type of red flag. So I would say anyone that's looking to go down the journey of security and learning more to really approach it from a first principles perspective, just because something doesn't make sense, there's probably a really good reason for it. Go in with it, in with it with a really low ego and like a really open mind and, and, and start to kind of go down that journey. I think for, for everyone in crypto, really good place to start is the CCSS framework. It's very approachable. You don't have to have a, you know, a computer science degree to read through it, it, it makes sense on the surface. And I think that's a really good starting point to just understand, you know, kind of to my earlier points, there's a bunch of questions in there that, that you should expect your crypto firms to do. It's certainly not a silver bullet, no framework is, but I think it's a really good starting point for anyone in crypto. And then there's also a lot of overlap that you could apply to your personal life as an individual crypto uh, investor. Where can we send people to find you on the internet? Twitter, LinkedIn, oh. somewhere else? I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm a little bit um, overwhelmed with connection requests at times. I am on Twitter. I tweet quite often. Um, I'm not quite as, as witty as potentially you are, um, but yep, there I am. Um, the, uh, the the actual the banner image is from the Thorchain hack, and it was what the hackers, the note that the hackers left for the developers. And wow. I circled all part and read there because I think that it is um, it, it's very good advice. It's sagely advice, not only to everyone in the space, but just everyone in general, you know, you shouldn't rush code that controls nine figures. Yeah. I, I have not seen that before. That is incredible. I love that you it, put that as your image. It's kind of funny when the hackers leave you a note. Yeah. Well, and, and a note that basically is like kind of slapping your hand, like, Hey fools, uh, don't do this. But, uh, I, I do think that, um, uh, this is an ever-evolving space, and so this stuff is just getting started, right? So yourself and, and many of your peers and colleagues are are incredibly uh, important, but also uh, uh, part of the beauty of security is that uh, hopefully no one ever has to talk to you about it because that means that everything's secure, right? Is is one no, of the things. I, quite the contrary. I I'm I, I think you know again I think one of our tenets as a security program is we're here to help. 
Like yep. we're, we're not the department of no, we are here to help. And um, I think Zach really appreciates that where, you know, we're not always just saying no. And so I, I think from, from my perspective, I hope people do reach out. I hope people do talk to me. I, I've hired at least one person from DMing me on Twitter. And I am constantly talking to institutions and individuals um, that, um, that have questions about BlockFi's security program. And, and, and we do it quite a bit. We like to be very accessible. I love that. And I know uh, Zach speaks very highly of you. So whatever you're doing, keep doing, because he, uh, uh, he he feels very safe with uh, with you around, which is good. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to join us. Uh, I think that this is just a part of the market that most people don't hear from. And uh, we'll definitely have to do it again in the future as, as things continue to progress. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. See you, buddy. Thanks, Adam. See you. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. Make sure you're subscribed on 